off and we are recording. Um, so today we're really happy to welcome Emma Maris back to campus. Emma is an award-winning science writer with recent stories published in the Atlantic, Nature, National Geographic, High Country News on topics ranging from climate change, water policy, embracing nature, and animal welfare. Last evening, she hosted a stirring workshop on science writing for some of the students in our group. And today she's presenting a seminar related to her latest book, uh, Wild Souls, Freedom and Flourishing in the Non-Human World. We have a copy up here if anybody wants to look at it. And we still have a couple of slots, two slots for people that might wanna to go to dinner with us tonight. So if you do come and see us, Later, so please join me in welcoming Emma Maris. Okay, hi everyone, and thank you so much for coming out. I think my mic's on, can you all hear me okay? All right, I'm getting thumbs up. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my latest book, Wild Souls. Um, and just to give you a sense of who I am, thanks so much for that great introduction. Um, I've been writing about mostly I started writing about conservation science in about 2005 and I've been writing for magazines and and writing books ever since in in related topics um, but also always sticking with conservation as kind of the core of my beat so when I started researching this book um I yeah I came from a kind of a I, although I didn't myself get a conservation biology degree, I came from a sort of a conservation value set background, combined with also just sort of a general um, environmentalist outlook. Um, but I also really, you know, considered myself an animal lover in a kind of a general way. Um, and I became increasingly interested in how looking at conservation problems um, by looking at the individual animals that were involved sometimes got us into interesting ethical dilemmas. So that's what this talk is about. And how do I advance? Just click. There we go. Okay, so let's start with this. Does, does everyone know what a Timbit is? A Timbit is what they call donut holes in Canada because of Tim Hortons. So this was a this is a Facebook post in which this guy, Randy Scott, bought a thousand Timbits and then just drove around feeding them to bears. Um, and he did this, you know, for the social media clout. Uh, but he got in huge trouble for doing this because it's not, you're not supposed to go around feeding Timbits to bears. Everybody knows that, except apparently Randy Scott. It's not good to feed wild animals. It creates situations in which wild animals are incentivized for behavior that might later get them shot. And everyone knows that it's bad all around. So Randy Scott ended up having to do some community service and paying some fines and having to promise to never feed Timbits to any animals ever again. Um, and I think that when most of us see something like this, our instinctive reaction is that this was a wrong action that he was going to feed these donut holes to these bears. And a philosopher named Claire Palmer calls this the laissez-faire intuition in her work and what it really what she really means here is that we have a pretty clear intuition that we should leave wild animals alone that our primary ethical duty to them is to leave them alone so on the one hand that means don't uh mess with them but it also means don't assist them necessarily so we have different rules for how we interact with our animals and how we act interact with wild animals. So if you own a horse and you don't feed the horse and the horse gets very skinny, you can get into trouble and you can be accused of a wrong action ethically. But if we see a very skinny deer or very skinny elk or something like that out in, out in the wild, we don't feel that there's any obligation for us to rush over and feed that animal. Presumably, the suffering involved is very similar, but we feel like we have different ethical duties because of our differing relationships to these two animals. Uh, so in my first book, Rambunctious Garden, which came out like 10 years ago now, um, I took a look at the idea of sort of nature as being a separate thing out there that's uninfluenced by humans. And I criticized that idea as 
no longer accurate or in fact never accurate in the first place. Um, the idea that humans are not a part of nature is just incorrect. And all of these values that we've built around the notion that humans shouldn't be part of nature or that they aren't a part of nature, that they can't be a part of nature um, are not only just scientifically false, but they often lead us down, I think, problematic paths when it comes to actually picking conservation actions and goals and figuring out what to do. Um, so I criticized that in Rambunctious Garden, but then it began to give me some thoughts about this laissez-faire intuition. The laissez-faire intuition seems to be built on this same dichotomy, this notion that somehow if they're in the wild, then they have nothing to do with us and our only obligation is to leave them alone. But increasingly, we see that the world around us has for millennia and is increasingly a, a very influenced by humanity, all the way from potentially the Pleistocene extinctions to generations of land management by indigenous people to current land management and land use change to climate change, right? Like, so you have all these different layers of the ways that humans have changed all of nature, even places that are far away. So does that mean that now we have slightly different obligations to the individual animals that are living in those places? Or put it more simply, are they now less wild? And does that mean we owe them more? So this opened up a potentially vertigo inducing uh, kind of collection of questions, right? If, if all of the animals that are out there are somehow living in our world, does that mean that all of their suffering in, in the state of nature is something that we need to worry about ethically now? And how could we possibly try to intervene or not intervene or adjust things so that they would, so that they would suffer less? Um, what are our obligations sort of in the Anthropocene to wild animals? And I got more interested in this when I was covering wolf reintroduction in Oregon, because I, I got to Oregon, I grew up in Seattle, and then I was living on the East Coast for a while, and then I moved to Oregon in 2013, and it was just about at the time that their wolf population was starting to recover. Um, wolves came over from Idaho, and in fact, the first wolf that came over from Idaho, Oregon was so unready that they boxed it up in a crate and sent it back to Idaho. Um, so uh, right around when I was getting there, this was um, OR4 was the, out, like the, the patriarch of the first um, reproducing pack in Oregon. So I was there at a time when there were less than 50 wolves. And so each of these wolves was known to researchers and many of them had collars and many of them had tags and they had their DNA on file and they had designations like OR4. And, and I kept wondering how wild these animals were really, uh, because we knew where they were, we knew what they were up to, we gave them names, they had collars on, and if they misbehaved, we shot them. So it seemed to me that they weren't fully wild in the sense that I kind of felt wild animals should be. So then I started thinking, well, if this animal isn't wild, what do we owe it? Over time, I came to think that the, the way that we use the word wild is often very imprecise, even when we're applying it to animals. And I think that, you know, sometimes we mean that the animal is an undomesticated, is genetically undomesticated, the wolf as opposed to the dog. And sometimes we mean that the individual animal is not tamed, a wild horse versus a domestic horse that is tamed and rideable. So in that version, an animal could start out wild, but end its life as a not wild animal. Um, but the more I began to look at these different definitions of wild, the more many of them seemed problematic because they seem to go back to the same old human nature do, you know, dichotomy that I criticized in my earlier work. But I did think that they were often trying to get at something that I do think is, is, is potentially valuable, which is not how much these animals are uninfluenced by humans, but how much they just get to make their own decisions, how much they have sort of personal autonomy in their own lives. I do think that is valuable for many animals. Now, it might not be valuable for a jellyfish because a jellyfish may be much more a creature of instinct, but for a complex, cognit a cognitively complex animal like a wolf with a social life and a very complicated set of behaviors, that kind of autonomy is something that I think it values, even if it couldn't articulate it that way. So to give you an example, when wolves hit about one or two or three, depending on, on the wolf and the situation, uh, they get this urge to disperse, to leave their, their parents and go off and find their own mate and find their own territory and settle down and form their own family. 
I mean, we can probably relate to this kind of general life history pattern, right? We, we kind of get the urge to disperse ourselves. So if you have a wolf pack and you put them in a zoo and you don't let them disperse, when they hit that age, they get pissed off and they try to escape and they try to jump over the fence and they try to dig under the fence and they, are, they feel they are stressed, they pace, you can tell that they're not happy animals. So in that sense, it seems as though by restricting their autonomy, we are making their lives less good. And in sort of a philosophical ethics way, that kind of wildness, the wildness of their own autonomy does seem to be something that's valuable. So that's the sort of thesis in a nutshell of this book. Um, and and what, the, what I really ended up doing with this book is, is going on kind of a ride where I really tried to figure out if the value of nature isn't in its wildness or its, or its separation from humanity, then where is it? Where could it be? And it seems like there's lots of different locations of value out there in the, in the world. And the first one is in these individual animals. Now, this is one that I didn't really think about very much when I was considering the world through a purely conservation lens, because I typically thought of individual animals as units of a population. Um, but at the same time, like most of us, I certainly think would, you know, would have frowned upon somebody who hurt an animal for no reason. So, uh, you know, I think most of us share a very baseline understanding that animals, sentient creatures have some sort of inherent value in and of themselves. Um, in up to and including, you know, uh, ground squirrels. So you wouldn't hurt a ground squirrel for no reason. You might decide that there are good reasons to do so, but if you're just torturing it for fun, I think most people would agree that was bad. Then there are all these other locations of value in the natural world that we are kind of trained to see and appreciate, but often we're not incredibly precise about how we're using them. Uh, species, ecosystems, the, the kind of generic or overarching term of biodiversity, and then these last two, nativeness and naturalness, which I think then go back to some things that I critiqued in my first book, which is the idea of there being one perfect, acceptable suite of species and ecosystem relationships in, for each place, and any changes to that are not okay, especially if they're caused by humans. I think that kind of purist worldview is, is definitely under question in the conservation world, and and I would say that increasingly people coming up in the field aren't thinking that way. They're thinking about how systems are going to change in the future as the climate changes and as, as changes unroll. So the focus on nativeness and naturalness, I think, is coming under question. So in the book, what I do is I try to look at case studies where some of these potential values trade off against each other. So I think a lot of us have this sense that animal lovers and, and environmentalists are on the same team and that we're always have the same goals, but that's really not true. And there's a lot of really interesting case studies where species and individual, the sort of the value of species is, uh, is kind of pitted up against the inherent worth of a sentient animal. So I'm gonna go through some of those now, um, but first let's figure out like where the, who, who talks about these values. So in the book, I kind of do some pop philosophy um, which was fun. I, you know, I've spent my career doing pop science, so it's somewhat similar in that I'm trying to take an academic discipline with its own jargon and conventions and kind of culture and bring it into language and a way that everybody can understand. And my husband's a philosopher, so I kind of had a, a little bit of a cheat code there. I was able to run a lot of this by him and, and get him to help me. Like, for example, there's a philosophical piece of jargon that's ontology. And then there's another one that's called deontology, but they're not opposites. They're like totally unrelated. So anyway, point is once you figure out all these words and what they mean, philosophy is no harder than science. In fact, in some ways it's easier because the stats are easier. Um, so, uh, so there's two main ways of looking at the value of sentient animal lives or two, not two main ways, but two, two ways that have been dominant in Western thinking for many decades. And one of them is this utilitarian approach that Peter, that's most associated with Peter Singer. And this is basically the idea that suffering is bad and happiness is good. And you should always just do the math in your head and figure out whether your action will cause more suffering or more happiness and pick whichever alternative leads to the most happiness and the least suffering of all of the sentient beings that are involved and that's it, it's, it's like a math problem. Um, but interestingly, in his original work back in the 70s, 
Uh, he did not in really include wild animals in the math problem. Uh, the book was really focused on uh, animal, you know, animal agriculture, eating meat, and uh, animal experimentation in the lab. He he go, he deals with wild animals very quickly and basically just says laissez-faire, like they're not our they're not our thing. The other approach is most associated with this guy, Tom Reagan, which is the animal rights approach, which is um, not so much that you have to do the math about pleasure and pain, but more that every sentient creature is a kind of like a, a being with inherent worth. And so they're just rules. You just can't use them as a tool to achieve other objectives, just as it, it is wrong to use, to sacrifice human lives for the greater good, some people think. Uh, then it is also wrong to sacrifice animal lives for the greater good. Um, but he too doesn't really think we have any obligations to fiddle with the lives of wild animals. Um, we should just leave them alone and protect their habitat. Um, contrast all of this with the conservation ethic. Um, it, and, and, and the nice thing about conservation biology is that, that Michael Soule wrote this paper in 1985 that basically just laid out the normative postulates of the field for us so it, with bullet points, no less. So it's, it's really easy to, oh, I see I'm missing a, I'm missing a, okay, I'm not gonna fix my slides right here. Okay, but I'm missing a quote mark there. But, um, you know, so here are the normative postulates. Diversity of organisms is good, extinction is bad. And then he directly addresses the question of individual animals in this 1985 paper, which is very handy. Right at the beginning of the field, he says very clearly, suffering in animals is unpleasant, perhaps regrettable, but it's just not the concern of conservation biology. So now having armed ourselves with these different theories that clearly are not uh, always in congruence, uh, we can look at one possible theory that tries to bring these approaches together into some sort of reconciliation. And that is Val Plumwood's approach, which she calls ecological animalism. In this approach, she tries to see humans as an animal that is embedded in a food web with other animals. So rather than a kind of a, a Peter Reagan, uh, Peter Reagan, I'm mushing my philosophers together, a Tom Reagan approach, which would say, do not uh, mess with wild animals or do not ever kill an animal, she would say it is sometimes okay to kill an animal and eat that animal because that's our ecological relationship with them. But then it's also okay for sometimes animals to kill us and eat us because that's their ecological relationship with us. And, and uh, her philosophical journey is uniquely gripping because she came up with this theory after surviving a near-death encounter with a saltwater crocodile in Australia and she almost got eaten. So, I mean, like really she almost died. So I feel like if anyone had the right to say that humans are part of an ecological food web and they need to kind of accept the fact that they might be food, it's her. Um, so I find her, um, I find her approach very compelling because it doesn't separate humans out away from all the other animals as if we're in some sort of other category. And it also um, leaves room for interactions that are violent or that lead to death within a universe uh, uh, that is all sort of ethically coherent. But it's sometimes hard to get your brain around because those other systems seem so much more straightforward and black and white, like, uh, a, a, like an algorithm you can put your ethical conundrum through and you get the answer out the other end. Whereas Plumwood's approach is less like that and more very much case by case. And you have to use sort of more uh, uh, different tools to come up with answers. So here's a few of these case studies and we can go through these relatively quickly so we can get to the Q and A because I'm really excited to hear uh, sort of how this is all hitting you. Um, the first one is about zoos essentially, zoos and aquariums and whether putting wild animals on display is okay. Um, and this is one that I wrote a sp specific chapter about and then the chapter itself um, I also published a version of that in the New York Times uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and I used elephants as a sort of case study here because elephants have been under fire recently. Well, the elephants haven't been under fire. The, the captivity of elephants in zoos has been criticized increasingly because the elephants are really big. They're really socially complicated. They normally in their daily lives have a very complicated social life and they walk a gazillion miles and they don't just like stand there 
in a little area um, all alone, which is what many zoo elephants are asked to do for 40 or 50 years. Um, so there's been a kind of a movement of, of the public not wanting to see these animals in uh, municipal zoos. So here's the New York Times piece that I, I did. Whoa. Um, oh, wait, I, that's right, we're on, we're on Zoom. Um, hello, Zoomers. Um, so this is the piece that I wrote about that. And this was really fun because after this piece came out, I actually did a radio debate with Dan Ash, who used to be head of Fish and Wildlife and is now head of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And um, I know you can Google it up, but like, honestly, I feel like I creamed him. Like, I feel like I won. <laughs> um, but this is the basic argument that the flourishing of sentient creatures is valuable and that so, at least some animals, and here I'm picking the sort of easiest cases, the cases that it's really hard to argue against the fact that they don't do well in captivity and that they try to escape. I have a lot of stories of escape in the book. Um, and so then if, if there is suffering associated with their captivity, then we sort of have to justify that their captivity on other grounds that the, they must outweigh that. And then I just dug deep into the literature about whether or not zoos kind of create a conservation ethic in the visiting public or whether they meaningfully contribute to conservation efforts in terms of conservation breeding on a large scale. I'm like, honestly, they just don't. Um, certainly the evidence to show that they change uh, opinions is very thin. Um, the evidence in, that they sent me, I said, give me your best papers that show that zoos turn people into you know, warriors for conservation. And the very papers that they sent me had facts in there like that only 29% of people who go to zoos even read the signs. Um, and that largely, if you interview them about why they went, they said they wanted a nice day out with their families. Like that's why people go to zoos. It isn't to become more knowledgeable about endangered species. And while some, there are some conservation breeding programs at zoos and aquariums, uh, the AZA says that there's about 50 such programs across the country. They also say that they have about 6,000 species in captivity which means that 5,550 of them are being bred simply for display. And none of those animals or their babies or their grandbabies are ever gonna get out. And they're just there for us to look at. So I just don't think it's ethically justified. I just don't think that the, what we get out of it is good enough to justify it for, for, for at least for these more cognitively complex species. And I honestly think they should just stop breeding unless they're part of an actual conservation program that's actually gonna release them someday. In fact, just this week, somebody sent me a thing about a, a Sumatran tiger dying at the Point Defiant Zoo in Tacoma. And, you know, of course, the zoo made a big deal about how the Sumatran tigers are. Um, the reason it died is because they were putting these two tigers together to try to get them to mate. And they were saying, well, you know, this is a very rare species. There's less than 300 left and we were trying to get them to mate. But anybody who knows anything about big cat conservation knows that rewilding a bunch of captive cats is practically impossible. It's totally pointless. The way you actually do big cat conservation is you protect their habitat and you deal with the poaching. And then they reproduce just fine. They, they'll, they'll fill it out. You don't need to breed them up in a bunch of random zoos all over the country and then ship them in with absolutely no life skills or ability to survive in the wild. Um, okay, so I'll just add too that, that the, while the elephant is the case study I use in the book, increasingly, thanks to the Netflix documentary, My Octopus Teacher probably is my theory, uh, we're seeing a lot of pushback against this, even for invertebrates in this case, uh, at the same zoo, I'm not trying to pick on the point to find a zoo, I just read the Seattle Times, so this is what I see. Um, the, they got this giant Pacific octopus, they captured it from the wild for display, and they were like, hey, let's have a naming contest, and everybody was just like, how dare you capture this octopus from the wild, put it back please. Um, the, you know, there really did seem to be a shift in opinion among the general public. So I think that's really interesting. Um, now SeaWorld, I don't know how many of you saw the, the 2013 documentary Blackfish about, about uh, orca uh, captivity that was incredibly, uh, I'd say very persuasive and definitely heartbreaking. And since that time, SeaWorld has said that they're no longer going to breed orcas. And if you go to their website now, it's all about rescues, right? Like this is their website right now is this is the first thing you see is some video about rescuing sea turtles. And then when you go to buy tickets, it says that your ticket price is a, uh, helps fund wildlife rescue and rehabilitation efforts. So this is how they're rebranding themselves 
is as a big sanctuary. Now, uh, I'm very skeptical about how many of their animals they're still breeding and you know what's actually going on behind the scenes. But I think it's very interesting that at least they think this is what the public wants to hear about what's going on. I think there's a shift in values. Um, I'm gonna, um, this is one of the comments that uh, was on my New York Times article. And I really thought this just kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, zoos say that what they do is they connect people to other species, to wildlife. And the irony is, is if they do their job correctly, then people will get mad that these, the wildlife stuck in the zoo. So they're putting themselves out of business at some level. Next, let's talk about captive breeding. So uh, now we're getting into the sort of like what conservations do for a living. So it might get a little more uncomfortable. Um, for the captive breeding case, I went with condors, um, partly because they're just, um, it's such a great, it's just a great case study. And partly because little known to many younger people, not everybody was, uh, there was quite a bit of opposition among uh, environmentalists to capturing all the condors back in the 80s and doing that that captive breeding program. There were a lot of people who thought uh, that it just wouldn't work and that we'd kill them all. And that's 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 a more pragmatic objection. But that there are also many people who felt that it was just too undignified, that it just spoiled the wildness of the condor. And there were there were essays written about how we should just let it die with dignity rather than uh, you know capture it and humiliate it by making it breed in, in cages and so on. Um, so this was an actual protest that was outside the Los Angeles Zoo that was ongoing when they were capturing some of the condors. They had to actually reroute some of the condors to San Diego Zoo because they didn't want to tangle with these protesters. So it was contentious at the time, um, but it totally worked, right? Uh, and I think, uh, and the, you know, it worked in the sense that they, we still have condors. It, it's not complete. The work is not complete. Otherwise, this bird wouldn't have the, word, the number 30 attached to its wings. Condors are still incredibly heavily managed. They are not wild in the sense of being completely autonomous. Most of them have to be captured at least once in their lifetimes to get uh, treated for lead poisoning and like chelation therapy. They're constantly monitored um, and many of them are still in captivity. So this is a work in progress, but I think it's pretty fair to say that given how quickly they were dropping dead of lead poisoning, that if we hadn't taken them into captivity, there would be zero left today. Um, and in this case, I think it's a pretty defensible, you know, did, did these condors suffer when they had to go into captivity? Probably. They probably didn't like being in those flight cages as much as they liked soaring around in the desert. But if you look at it from their perspective of an individual condor, those individual condors also would have been killed by lead poisoning. So those individual lives were probably saved by the breeding program. So in this case, I think it's pretty easy to justify what was done. Yeah. Um, you know, they, the, they, the individuals that were taken from the wild probably were not pleased, but they probably had longer lives. And some of them were then able to be re-released later. The last condor that went into captivity, adult condor nine, was like the last free condor in the world, was able to be released in, a, in his sort of forties. And he immediately went back to his old territory and started up his old nest again. Um, and then he died a couple of years later for lead poisoning. So he had a life that was that exhibited both attempts to make it right. So I think that captive breeding in that case, you know, if, if it works and it succeeds and you get them back out on the landscape and they have not too crappy of a life while they're in the program, I think you can pretty easily ethically justify it. But I do think that you have to pay attention to the life, quality of life, and you have to realize that you are asking these individual animals to give up their autonomy for the good of their species and that we can't get their consent in any kind of way. We just have to make the decision for them. And you know, we should think about that hard when we do it. The next one is killing introduced predators to protect rare animals. And I often find that when you talk to students in North America, they are not, this isn't necessarily even on their radar as a conservation tool, but if you go to Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, any islands, this is it. This is like the main this thing you do. This is one of the most common ways to try to save species from extinction. Um, so my favorite example of this is um, Gulf Island, where the Tristan albatross breeds. In fact, almost the entire population of the Tristan albatross, right? So it's a very tidy case study. You've got like the whole species on one island and you've got these introduced mice that are 
vampiring the chicks. They like climb up on the chicks and they drink their blood and they kill them. So is it okay to kill the mice to save the albatross, right? Now, anybody who's been kind of brought up in the conservation world will just say yes right away. But interestingly, there's some, some people out there who are beginning to say no within the conservation movement and they're calling themselves compassionate conservation kind of conservationists. So some of you may have seen some of the literature back, on, uh, back and forth on this, but it's like hot, spicy stuff, right? So there's papers by the compassionate conservationists saying that killing is, is wrong and it's arrogant and it's us trying to impose our will on the landscape that we think that we're doing it to remove human influence. But in fact, what we're doing is just putting more human influence on the landscape. And then there's people firing back and saying, well, what about the suffering of the chicks that have their blood you know, being drained? And it's a very lively debate. Um, a lot of papers coming out, fun to read. Um, and, but I think it's, you know, and it's very urgent. There are species of this, this is the kakapo from New Zealand. There are species that are extremely threatened by introduced predators. And if we do not either put them somewhere where there are no introduced predators or kill the introduced predators, we will lose them. So it's not just hypothetical. Uh, New Zealand is in some places, the, in some ways, the ultimate place where this happens. Um, they are an island nation. They love their birds. They love their endemic birds, especially their um, dumb, flightless, endemic birds. Um, and they have all these introduced predators. They have rats, they have stoats, they have possums that aren't really predators, they're herbivores, but for some reason they get kind of lumped in. And they have cats and they have pigs and they have all sorts of stuff. And so they have this um, kind of national initiative called Predator Free 2050. The whole country is trying to kill all the stoats, rats, and possum, Australian possums, not our possums by 2050, the whole, the whole country, North Island, South Island, Little Islands, the whole thing. I mean, that's millions and millions of animals that they're trying to kill by 2050. But if they did it, it really would make a huge ecological difference and probably make a big difference to a species like a kiwi. So what I thought was really interesting was the kind of citizen participation in this activity. Um, this has become something that you do almost as like a patriotic Kiwi. This is something you do if you love New Zealand, if you love the nature there, and you can get these rat traps and you can set them up in your backyard. And it's become a really common thing to do with school children and community groups and the tribes have the hunting, I mean, these trapping efforts. And it's led to this culture where these introduced predators have become so vilified that they're treated kind of shittily, honestly. Oops, I said I wouldn't swear, sorry. Um, so for example, I was told that in New Zealand, if you see a possum on the road, the patriotic thing to do is to swerve and run it over. Um, and in this case, there was a school fundraiser where there was a possum hunting contest and then the little corpses were dressed up and there were prizes given for like the best dead possum outfit. Um, and these are just a couple of examples. Like if you go to Zealandia in Wellington, which is a predator free enclosure, you can actually buy a throw pillow that celebrates how much you hate these animals and want them dead, um, which you can then put on your couch, I guess, and think about how much you want to kill these animals every day. Um, so we, to me, I found this culture troubling, right? Because these animals, don't know that they're bad guys. They have no clue that they're in the wrong place. They are not there on a mission of destruction. There is no malevolence or malice in their hearts. And they were all born in New Zealand. So the idea of blaming them personally for the way that they're functioning ecologically creeps me out. Like I'll just put it, you know, like I just think it's, 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 it's unpleasant. Now it may be that you decide that you want, that you, you know, you come to a decision that you want to kill these animals to save these other animals, but to do it in a way where you're celebrating it to the extent of dressing up their corpses and buying home decor about it strikes me as slightly odd. So here's the compassionate conservationists. Um, Ariane Wallach is one of the leading proponents of this. And she just feels that it is unethical to go in and, and make these godlike choices about who lives and who dies. And yet the critique of her approach is that what she often offers as an alternative for conservationists is to let 
the um, say introduced predators or like in uh, the Australian context, a, a lot of the predators that you worry about are cats and foxes. So her solution is stop killing dingoes and the dingoes will kill the cats and the foxes or at least keep them suppressed to a level where the small native animals can thrive. So it isn't that she's removing killing or suffering or blood from the system. It's just that she's removing her part, her direct causal act activity in that killing. Um, one thing that I did find interesting in the second quote there is that in some of the work that her group has published, she talks about there not being correct answers for some of these conundrums. And I think that's, there is a, a philosophical uh, concept of a situation in which there is no, you know, often in ethics, you're looking for the action that will be the correct action, the right action, as opposed to the morally wrong action. But some philosophers believe that in some decisions, maybe because of stuff that our ancestors did or that we've done, there are no options that are morally right. There are only different degrees of wrongness. And so you have to pick the least wrong option, and then you have to live with the wrong that you have done. And they call that the moral residue. And I think that that is helpful for me because I do think that I am willing to kill to save some animals, to save some species from extinction. But I also feel like we should acknowledge the moral residue of that killing. That maybe the killing that we do to do that isn't completely acceptable and we should just be feeling very merry and happy about it. I just wanted to mention too, that although almost a lot of these examples are on islands, we are doing some conservation killing here on the continental North America. And the most recent uh, version of this is uh, controlling barred owls that are coming into spotted owl habitat and either taking nesting sites from spotted owl or mating with spotted owl and creating hybrid offspring. Um, nobody loves this solution, by the way, the fish and wildlife. I, mean, it's, I think it's still in a um, it's still in a pilot project. This isn't like official policy yet. It's and and even the people who are out there shooting the owls don't like it. Nobody likes shooting owls. It's something about their eyes facing forward, I think. But the, no, it doesn't sit right with anybody. But there is, you know, this is another example where the 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 love that we have for the species of spotted owl is up against the individual lives of these barred owls. And in this case, it's interesting too because the reason that barred owls are coming into their territory is a little bit ambiguous. Is it because we put up telephone poles and trees for them to hop over the, the Great Plains on? Is it because of climate change? Is it because of something else? I mean, a large part of it is, is because the barred owl is just way more flexible than the spotted owl. And the spotted owl uh, is in these, these little remnants of old growth that, only, that it can only live there, whereas the barred owl can live anywhere. Um, so, there's a sense in which the barred owl is just more fit in, in the world that we have created. And in some ways, I'm interested in the hybrid offspring, the sparred owl and their fitness levels. And I talk about another study in the book where um, human introduced salamanders mated with native salamanders and the offspring, the hybrid offspring were more fit. And so eventually conservationists decided to let the hybridization continue because it was creating a, a population that was more likely to persist into the future. And then finally, I'll just mention that, um, you know, just as I've talked about with those hybrids, we do see some conservation killing where there's a genetic introgression and we feel that the individuals aren't pure enough. Um, and the example that I use in the book is of this case where the, these wolf pack in, in Eastern Washington um, got together with a dog and a dog escaped. It was, a, it was also a sheep guarding dog, ironically. Um, and it ran off with the wolves and decided to join their pack and it was a very romantic story and everybody kind of loved it, but the, you know, uh, Washington Fish and Game was not excited about their endangered, at the time it was a state level endangered species having hybrid wolf dog puppies. So it intervened, it found the pregnant wolf and it, and it spayed it. And then when the other, and then when it continued, when the wolves continued to try to associate with the dog, the wolves went to Wolf Haven by Olympia. And so this wolf lost its privileges of being wild because it was made the wrong choice of mate. Um, and so in this case, the wildness of autonomy was put up against the genetic wildness. And it seemed like we chose genetic wildness over autonomy. And yet I think many of us feel a little pull towards the other direction that if it's a wild animal, it should be able to decide who to marry and have babies with. 
So the, I'm, this is the same list that I put up at the beginning of you know, possible locations of, of value in the non-human world. Um, I don't think that nativeness and naturalness are valuable. I just, I just don't. Um, I think that they're both concepts that spring from the idea that anything humans touch turns to rubble. And while that has often been true, it isn't necessarily always true. And humans are animals and they can have good, productive, mutually respectful, beneficial relationships with other species. And in fact, I think that is the way forward for conservation is figuring out how to have better relationships with other species rather than having no relationships with other species. So that leaves us with flourishing with, and then species ecosystem biodiversity, all of those things which we can lump into, which I kind of talk in the book about being the complexity and the flow. Um, and this is where it gets like, whoops, a little bit tricky um, because I've added human compassion and humility because I think that a lot of the times when we talk about wanting to preserve wildness or naturalness, at some level, what we're talking about there is we want to not be too aggressively managerial. We want to step back a little bit and let the other species uh, run themselves to some, uh, to some extent. And I totally agree with that, that there should be places on the landscape where we're not micromanaging every little thing. And, but we don't need the concepts of wildness or naturalness in order to capture that. We can capture that with, by borrowing from this other school of philosophy, which is called virtue ethics and, look, and describing that with the virtue of humility, of not being arrogant. So I think that that helps capture some of what we, what we find intrinsically, like what we find so compelling about the idea of wilderness without falling into this humans over here and nature over here trap. But when you look at the, the, the list at the top and you see that you've got sentient individuals and you also have these complex ecosystems, ultimately you reach a bit of an impasse. And that's why I talked about the moral residue because you, when you compare, when you know, sometimes maybe you have to kill, like there was one study that I read where there was a collection of penguins, rare penguins, and they had, they had one cat that basically lived there and was eating all their babies. And this one cat was set up to destroy the entire population. So all they had to do to save this entire population of penguins was kill one cat. So you're like, okay, I think that I can, I think I can live with that. One cat save the whole population. But the math isn't always that easy, right? Like what if it's a, what if you, I mean, Australia promised that they were gonna kill 3 million cats by 2020. I don't think they made their goal, but that was their stated goal, 3 million cats by 2020. Um, and that's a lot of blood. That's a lot of bloodshed. Is there a number that's too high? I don't know if there's a right answer for that. There's no math that can give you the right answer because the things that you're putting up against each other are not in the same currency. They're not in the same units. The lives of sentient individuals cannot be mathed against ecosystems. They're not the same thing. So ultimately you have to just use your best judgment. And that's a really scary feeling. A part of the reason that they're irreconcilable is because when you care about individuals, you care, the work of caring for individuals is basically all about routing all the resources towards that individual to keep it happy and healthy and flourishing. So anybody who's been a parent or a pet owner or taken care of any living thing knows, knows this instinctively. When you have someone or something you're taking care of, you route the food towards it. You route the resources towards it. You make sure that it stays healthy. But all that food and resources that you're putting in your baby's mouth has to come from somewhere, right? And it has to come from other individuals, whether it's plants or animals or fungi. That's the flow that knits ecosystems together, the moving of energy and resources from individual to individual. So if you really care about caring for individuals, you wanna put all that flow into one box, one individual. But if you really care about ecosystems, then you wanna keep that flow flowing. And the only way you can keep that flow flowing is by letting things eat other things, by letting the blood run, by letting the death happen. So they are fundamentally irreconcilable. And that was really hard for me because I wanted answers. I wanted there to be a math equation that could tell me how many cats it was okay to kill to save a species. And I found Val Plumwood helpful again because she wrote about this. And she says that any society that values individual life forms highly will experience conflict with the flows of the food chain. 
I mean, this is just a fundamental physics problem, right? She thinks that you can you can you can you can imagine a way where you can have your, both of these perspectives at once, where you can hold both of these perspectives at once. It's an ethical order where the flow is valuable, the individuals are valuable, but we all take our turns. She at another part of the same uh, same essay, she talks about how your life, your body, isn't really yours. It's like a book you borrow from the library, and eventually you have to turn it back in. So at the end of your life, you re-enter the flow. And on this understanding, not all deaths are ethically wrong. They're part of the system. But it's hard for us because we live in a world where to care for the individual means to prevent or delay its death. Um, so ultimately, where I land is that understanding these problems, understanding the issues, understanding the tensions are important for any working conservationist or anybody who works with wildlife management or anybody who takes care of any individual animals or children or plants. It's important to think about this stuff, but I can't give you the right answer of which is more valuable in any given situation. And it's always going to depend on the specifics of the situation. And ultimately, you're going to have to make your own judgment call based on your own values. And I wish there was a math equation that fit on a t-shirt, but if you wanted a math equation that would fit on a t-shirt, you wouldn't have chosen ecology. <laughs> and that's it, that's what I got. So thanks, Sam. I, um, we have some time for questions. And so I'll try to get a microphone over to you as soon as you can, if you wait, raise your hand. Sarah. All right, thank you so much. That was such a fascinating talk. Your book, Rambunctious Garden, really shaped my dissertation research. I'm now an assistant professor here and I think of a lot about environmental values. And um, you're talking about human, or not human and non-human flourishing. You know, there's this Greek term eudaimonia. Um, and I was wondering if you've engaged, and this is self-serving, but if you've engaged in the concept of relational values in the domain of conservation science, and I've written some papers on it, it's been launched as this idea or a way to like move beyond this intrinsic instrumental value dichotomy and really think about what are the important relationships that humans need to have with uh, species and how even connecting people can connect in terms of how they relate to nature and experiences in nature and with wildlife can also connect people to each other. So I was just wondering if you've, not if you've read my papers, but- um... I would love to read your papers. <laughs> Please email them to me immediately. Happy to. <laughs> um, yeah, that relationship framework is one that I did look at at some level. Um, like for example, I looked at the work of Lori Gruen, who's an environmental ethicist who uses this framework that she calls entangled empathy. And the entangled there refers to the relationship between the human and the non-human. Um, and I find these relationships, I think that, that, that getting our relationship right, our relationships with the non-human world right is the core of what we're all trying to do here. So I find the relational approaches extremely compelling. The only caveat I would say to that is that then I worry about the, 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 the animals that don't have friends, right? Like, if you have a relationship with this animal because it's in your backyard or because you have a cultural connection to it, you might treat it differently than if it's a, 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 a possum or a rat from across the ocean who you don't have a relationship with and in fact you think is an evil bad guy. So I worry a little bit about how the relation, if you, if you overemphasize the relationality as, as, a, as a determiner of what you owe another sentient creature, then I worry about sort of unpopular animals being treated badly, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, charismatic. the charismatic, right, exactly. So, but on the other hand, I think that more broadly, thinking more relationally is probably gonna be helpful for us rather than thinking that we're somehow these like extraterrestrials who are not part of any of these food webs who have to uh, make these decisions as if we're looking down upon a chessboard or something. So yeah, I, I would love to read your work. Please do send it to me. Hi, I am a master's student here at uh, USU, and I am really curious if you ran into anything in your research looking at the flow of um, resources that go into the conservation of 
endangered individuals. So for example, I was a Forest Service employee and we worked on endangered salmon habitat and I drove a huge vehicle around that was a gas guzzler and I probably contributed more to climate change and habitat, de uh, habitat degradation than I probably ever helped. Um, and I've struggled with that a lot as a conservationist. Okay, so two two responses to that. And first is I engage with that a little bit in the book. Like I talk about how much money was spent on the condor uh, captivity, you know, the condor captive breeding program. Um, and and I do think that it's interesting that you know um, that in a conserv in the conservation world, the fewer there are of a species, the more valuable and the more investment worthy each individual becomes. Until we get to the point where like the last five are priceless, you know, and and we're throwing millions of dollars at them. And it creates this situation often where we don't intervene as, you know, as early as would be most cost effective. We wait until they're rare enough to be valuable enough for us to pay for the gas to go out and save them, right? So I, I, see, I see that that being that sort of valuation, that kind of economic valuation as being a, a, a kind of a trap sometimes. But I also wanna say, don't feel guilty about driving a gas guzzler, honestly, like, you, your individual contribution to climate change is really still very small, even if you are putting a lot of diesel in there and you're like doing, you know, you're working on these larger problems. If you feel guilty about climate change, like go try to change the, you know, go lobby the government about changing the, the federal uh, standards for gas mileage. And that'd be much more effective than worrying about your own personal consumption. That's my other hobby horse, but I won't get on that. <laughs> so. Hi, thanks for um, thanks for a great talk. I am curious about um, how much you think that like non-Western ways of thinking of these would are going to help solve these issues going forward. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I was hoping that question would come up. Um, so uh, the question is, how much are sort of non-Western approaches to thinking about relations with non-humans going to be helpful here? And the answer is very. Um, I, in the book, I went to Australia, I went to New Zealand, I went to Hawaii, and in all of those places, I engaged with the indigenous view of how to have these relationships. And often, these indigenous views are a little bit more Val Plumwoody esque. You know, um, you will often find in indigenous cultures, for example, a hunting ethic that really centers around a notion of reciprocity between you and your prey, and the sense that you're all in this kind of uh, living, dying, eating, being eaten thing together, and that at some level you're asking some sort of permission and you have some sort of payment, there's some sort of re reciprocity with the animal that you're killing. So there's tons of models in, in different indigenous societies all over the world for different ways of looking at this. And obviously they're all different, right? So one cool thing is that you, we've got hundreds and hundreds of different approaches that we can learn from. Um, so yeah, I do, I do get into that quite a bit in the book. So yeah, there's, there's, there's a ton to be learned there. And I think I was just talking earlier, uh, uh, with one of the students here about how nice it is that, uh, ecology and conservation do seem to be starting to take an actual interest in learning from some of these other approaches. So that's a really promising direction. Yeah. Do you want to, is there a question on the screen? I oh. can't really tell. Yes. Uh, no, it says, no, if you okay. have questions, present them in the chat. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> good, so my, my eyes are Zoomers, this is your last chance to present one in the chat, so. So, so Emma, one thought I had was, even though there's not a, a currency that we can use between the value of individuals and species or ecosystems, you argue that we should at least look at the trade-off and, yes. and look at that. Do you also add in the value of human aesthetics in those decisions and how does that play in? Yes, I do. And I think, you know, the word aesthetics is, uh, sounds kind of, um, I, I feel like we need a better word than aesthetics, like maybe cultural value or something like that, because uh, yeah, aesthetics just sounds like we just want to look at pretty, pretty animals. And that sounds very shallow. Um, but I think that the cultural value that species have to individuals and to cultures, both indigenous and, and new, newcomers, can be very considerable and worth throwing into your equation, right? Like, like I said, these are case by case decisions and, and each case is gonna be different. So if you've got Gough Island out in the middle of the South Atlantic that doesn't have any full-time human residents, you have a pure system in a way where you're really just looking at 
mice versus albatross. But in almost all other cases, what you're going to have is you're going to have a system that's completely embedded in multiple overlapping cultures. And you're going to have lots of people who have lots to say about who should live and who should die. And, and, and we should, it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it now, that if you're a conservation manager, you don't, shouldn't necessarily get to decide who lives and who dies just because you have the PhD. You know, there should be a larger, more inclusive process that brings all those people who have, a, have, a, have an interest in, the, in it together. And I think sometimes, and this is just based on my own interviews that I did for the book, sometimes there are hasty assumptions about what stakeholders will want. So for example, in the Hawaiian islands, I spoke to lots of native Hawaiians who said that they would be potentially interested in using genetic engineering technologies to save their native species. And every white conservationist I talked to said that they weren't researching that because native people would hate it. Um, but it looks like they hadn't actually asked them um, or at least hadn't spoken to the ones I had spoken to. It looks like they were making assumptions there. So, so this is, and I mentioned this in the book, but it's very much to be stressed that these will be collaborative decisions. These should be decisions and they're gonna be messy and they're gonna take millions of meetings and not, not everybody's gonna be happy and there's gonna be plenty of moral residue to go around. Somebody want the last question? Yeah. Here. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask, how do you think of the role of metaphor and analogy in policymaking and in, in the environmental space? You know, on the Factually podcast, you mentioned that the naturalizing uh, metaphor kind of got turned into an invasive species, warlike metaphor. And so I'd love to hear more about your thinking in that space. Right, so he's asking about how we talk about non-native species. And on a podcast that I was interviewed on, I talked about how before Charles Elton wrote his sort of big book about um, non-native species in the 1950s, where he, where he kind of inaugurated this invader metaphor that we've been using ever since, botanists talked about new, new plants as naturalized in, in their new habitats. And they had this kind of idea that if you showed up and you hung around for long enough and you reproduced successfully, you kind of got to join the club, you naturalized, you became part of the flora. Um, and that kind of weirdly, uh, that word still hangs on in, 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 in very specific botanical contexts, but for most of the rest of us, those, those non-natives are now invaders. And I do think that our metaphors really matter in how we end up making policy and what we end up spending money on and focusing on. I mean, I have seen many, I've heard in my career, many, many examples of places where Lots of money and lots of per, you know, labor hours and lots of herbicide was being spent removing non-native vegetation. And when you really ask them why, the answer was always because it is non-native. And that's just not good enough for a million dollars or 25 gallons of you know, herbicide or, or however many uh, labor hours. You know, I would much rather see, I mean, certainly in some cases, they were nuking these non-native plants because uh, they were trying to protect a rare orchid and they needed, they needed the better habitat. Okay, fine. I'm fine with that. Or maybe they're killing these invasive foxes because they're literally eating these, um, these native little mammals in Australia. You have a reason there. But there are cases, I'm sure we can all think of one, where somebody was killing something or, or rooting something up or hacking it down with machetes. And really the only justification was that it wasn't native. And that just drives me bonkers because there's not enough money to go around. So we should be spending it on stuff that's like really going to get us good solutions. Okay, well, thank you so much for a really engaging talk. Thanks for coming.